So far we've looked at surfaces in R3, so in XYZ space, in two ways. We've had the graphs, graphs of functions of two variables, so they sit inside of R3. And we looked at level surfaces of functions of three variables, and of course graphs of function of two variables is, you can write as a special case of level surfaces of function of three variables. However, when we get to the section in the next chapter on area of surfaces, which we need kind of crucially, or not kind of crucially, crucially, in chapter four when we um, deal with integrating vector fields, we, need, we will need surfaces in a, in a third way. So we'll need parametrized surfaces. We, we've talked about parametrizing curves, so you parametrize a curve, it means you write Parametrizing curve in the plane means you write the x and y coordinates in terms of some other variable, t. And, and, or parametrizing a curve in space means you write the x, y, and z coordinates in terms of one variable, t. We need to parametrize surfaces in space, and that means you write x, y, and z as functions of two extra variables, which, and the favorite names for those are u and v. So let's just start with an example. Um, so. An example, let me start by parametrizing a curve in space. There's a point to this, I swear. So let's start with a parametrized curve. In R3. So an example of one, um, I'll use x equals cosine of t y equals sine of t, and z equals t over 5. y divided by 5, oh, just to make the scales nice, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect the difficulty level of the example. If, if you think of this as describing where a particle is in space at time t, um, what's it doing? Well, it's x and y coordinates, cosine and sine, are clearly going around a circle, counter a circle of radius 1, so the origin, counterclockwise. And then the z-coordinate just goes up as t goes up and down as t goes down. So you should probably realize that this describes a spiral in space. It describes, you know, in fact, I should draw part of what I want to say in a minute because it will help me draw this spiral better. But it describes a spiral, but notice that the x and y coordinates, if you square x of t, and y of t, well, of course, that's cosine of t squared plus sine of t squared. It's 1. So all of this lies on points where x squared plus y squared equals 1. And if you recall, when we discussed some basic surfaces in space, that describes a cylinder, uh, a right circular cylinder centered on the, on the z-axis of radius 1, and it just goes like this, and this parametrized curve is a spiral that always lies on this cylinder. I'll try to draw it, possibly poorly, but you just kind of, um, let's see, when t, I could at least try to get t equals 0 correct, <laughs> t equals 0 around here, and then, and then the curve just kind of spirals around the cylinder. Okay, great. The, and it goes infinitely far that way and infinitely far that way. But our question now is, um, our question now is, how do you, can you do something analogous for the cylinder itself? Here's a surface that this curve is lying on. Can you describe the cylinder parametrically? This describes it as a, a level surface, a level surface of this equation. I mean, that's where this equation is satisfied. But can we write, for points on the surface, can we write the x-coordinate so on the cylinder as all the x-coordinates as some functions of u and v, the y-coordinate as a function of u and v, and the z-coordinate as a function of extra variables, so the parameters, u and v. And there are an infinite number of ways to do this. But Possibly the nicest here, you know, U and V should specify a point on the cylinder. Well, how do you specify a point on the cylinder? Well, you could specify its height, so its Z coordinate. 
with one of your numbers. So I'm going to let z just be v. I could pick v over 5 to be analogous to what I did for the curve, but it doesn't matter. And then, so that would describe my height. And then at that height, the cross-section is a circle. And if you just describe, well, the angle with the positive x-axis. So your other number could specify the angle with the positive x-axis, and that means your u is specifying where you are on the cross-sectional circle. So one way to parameterize a surface, uh, to parameterize a cylinder, is to say, OK, you give me a u and a v, and then that I'm, I look at the point x, y, z given by cosine of u, sine of u, v, and that describes every point on the surface. Every point on the surface can be written that way. It's kind of the most fundamental notion of a parameterization of a surface. We'll, we actually need more properties to, uh, to conclude some good theorems, but um, if you write this as a multi-component function, r, of u v, it's, it's r of u v is the x coordinate as a function of u and v, the y coordinate as a function of u and v, and the z coordinate as a function of u and v. And um, so our most basic notion of a parameterized surface is it's a function that's defined on, well, some subset of R2, so some subset of pairs of real number of all the pairs of real numbers. Doesn't have to be defined everywhere, this one is. But it's a function from some subset of R2 into R3. So that's our most basic notion of a parameterized surface. Of course, that's not, those aren't enough properties to even guarantee that the image of the map, um, in fact, dessert is two-dimensional. I should say that for mathematicians, R itself is, is called the parameterized surface. And, but, but you don't want to, uh, for the rest of us, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say the rest of us. I am a mathematician. But um, in, it's more intuitive to call the set of points you get out of it, so the points in the image, the points in the range, the surface defined by this. So I will try to adhere to that convention that I will call this the parameterization of a surface, but the actual surface, it's, when I talk about the surface itself, I mean the range of such a parameterization or the image of R. All right. So let's look at another example, so something slightly more interesting than parameterizing a cylinder, um, just to have another kind of cool parameterization. So you don't always have to start out with, oh, here's a surface, like the cylinder, give me a parameterization for it. You could start with a parameterization and then try to describe the surface or maybe have a have software um, sketch the surface for you. Um, so let's start out with, there's a particular parameterization I want. Let's try, here's another example. Um, also, you don't have to have u and v be your parameters. Those are the favorite surface parameter names. But, you know, it doesn't really matter. We could have x as a function of t and theta be t cosine of theta plus sine of theta. y is a function of t and theta and have it be t sine theta minus cosine theta and just let z which could be a function of t and theta, just be t. All right. So let's look at that. Um, the, what's the function from R2 to R3, or a subset of, of R2 into R3? But really, it's defined everywhere. The function R here, as a function of t and theta, is the triple. It's a multi-component function where these are the components. Great. So what is the image of this, what does the image of this look like? Um, you know, what does the surface defined by this look like? Well, 
and it's probably not clear to you. Um, but if you have computer software sketch it for you, or the, look at the, the picture in the book, what you'll see, what you'll see looks like something you ought to know. And all right, you want, it, it should look familiar to you. So what you'll see is something that looks roughly, well, not roughly like that. Let's try again. It looks roughly like this, and because I had the software draw it according to the parameterization, you'll see these lines on the surface. You'll see these lines that do go like this, like this, like this. These twisting lines on the surface um, all right, this is, they, they don't stop. So. Right. so what is this? Well, hopefully my picture is not so bad. And you remember, well, this looks like it might be a hyperboloid of one sheet. It is, and we'll see that in a second. A hyperboloid of, of one sheet. Um, we'll see that in a second. But why are these lines on it? I mean, where do you see the lines in the parameterization? Well, you can write this, you can split this up and look at the parts without a T. So there's a sine of theta here, a minus cosine of theta there, and a zero there. So you could write this as sine of theta minus the cosine of theta, comma zero, plus, and then all the other terms have a T, so factor out the T. Um, so plus T times cosine of theta, sine of theta, one. Well, how does that tell you why there are lines on the surface? Well, understand, now if you fix a theta, if you fix a theta, this is a, fic a fixed vector, this is a fixed vector, and so you've just got a fixed vector plus t times another fixed vector. That parameterizes a line. So if you fix a theta, you get a parameterized line. This is true in general. If you've got a parameterization of a surface and you fix one of the variables, well, that parameterizes a curve on your parameterized surface. So, yeah, right here for fixed thetas, you get these lines, and those are the lines you see that I drew on the hyperboloid or that you see in the book. This is called a ruled surface. It just means that it's of this form where it's some function, some triple of one of the variables plus t times a triple of that same variable so that you do get, when you fix the value of, in this example, theta, you do get parameterized lines. This is a ruled surface. <coughs> How do you see that it's the hyperboloid of one sheet, if you really want to? I mean, maybe for our purposes and in some problems, you wouldn't care if you identified it as a hyperboloid of one sheet, so as being the level surface of, of a function that we know defines a hyperboloid of one sheet. But you can just do the exercise. It's not difficult to take these three, these three component functions, or these, and verify that x of t theta squared plus y of t theta squared minus z of t theta squared equals 1. You can verify that so that all the points that you get in the range of this, so in the image, y on hyperboloid <coughs> x squared defined by x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals 1. It takes a little more work to verify that you get them all, but you do. And you know, that's why you see the hyperboloid of one sheet and why you see lines sitting on it if you have software graph it according to the parameterization. 
All right, I want to do one last kind of general example um, before I make a definition, state a theorem, and then look at a couple of examples at the end. So, um, kind of a third example, except it's not specific, is, well, suppose you had, suppose you have a surface defined as the graph of a function of two variables. Can you view it as a parameterized surface in any reasonable way? And the answer is, yeah, anytime you've got the graph of a function of two variables, it's easy to, to present that graph as the image of a parameterized, as a parameterized surface. Um, how do you do it? it? It just looks kind of silly when you write it. You let x be u, you let y be v, and then x is u, y is v, well then z is f of u, v, so that your parameterization of the graph of f is just u comma v comma f of u, v. This seems silly, but it actually is useful, and it is nice to know that you know, a surface that we look at as a graph, we can also look at as a parameterized surface. All right, we need more properties than just, than just oh, uh, parameterization of a surface is a function from some subset of R2 and R3. No, we need, we need to restrict what our domain, is. well, for, at least for simple parameterizations, we need to restrict the kind of thing or kind of subset of R2 we want for our domain. We want to, to require some differentiability, and we, um, we need some condition that corresponds to what we had for parameterized curves when we defined a regular parameterized curve, and regular meant that the derivative was never zero. We need to generalize that condition to more variables, and it's not completely obvious how that generalizes, but I'll tell you in a second. So, A definition. A local regular parameterization and you can do this you can look at surfaces in more dimensions than three, or when I say look at, I don't mean you can picture them, really. I mean, you can investigate them. But we're going to care, we're going to worry about surfaces in R3. If you look in the more depth portion of the section, you can see surfaces parameterized in more dimensions. A local regular parameterization of a surface in R3 consists of, all right, you need three, three things. One, um, a non-empty, open, connected open. We're trying to define kind of basic parameterizations, and one of the reasons this is called local is because we're going to care about this near points, and and in open neighborhoods of points, and in fact we want them to be connected so that things don't get too weird as you jump from one piece of a set to another, so we just require them to have one piece. A non-empty connected open subset W in R2, so this is going to be the domain of our parameterization. Two, all right, we need some differentiability. We could require it to be, uh, have more differentiability than BC1, so more differentiability than continuously differentiable, but that's enough for almost all of our purposes. So we'll define it as a continuously differentiable function.
R um, from W, so from our domain, into R3. Uh, let me write R equals R of UV to give the variable name, to give the variable some names. And then it'll make it easier to write the next condition. A continuously differentiable function. And then I want to put conditions on this. It's a continuously differentiable function from W into R2, into R3, but such that for all U and V, so for all U, V in W, the partial derivative vectors um, So the, you take the partial derivatives of, of the vector valued func of the uh, multi-parameter function r, take its partial derivative with respect to u, or you can take its partial derivative with respect to v, you get two multi-component functions, such that for all u, v, and w, r, u, and r, v, r, all right. The linear algebra term is linearly independent. Um, I don't necessarily expect that you know linear algebra, so let me say for two, ver two, for two vectors, this is easy to define, are linearly independent, i.e., they're um, um, well, neither are you nor are v is a scalar multiple of the other. So it is a constant. Times the other. And we looked at this back, back when we did cross products of vectors. That's in R3. That's exactly the same as saying, so I'm going to do some very bad English, I'm going to write IE again, or maybe I'll write equivalently so I don't here, we'll put a period. Equivalently, RU cross RV is not the zero vector. All right, this is what we want for uh, a local regular parameterization. And, of course, the image of such a thing, or the range of such a thing, is what we say is the surface defined by the parameterization. So the surface is the range of this, the image. Um, great. Why would we require these properties? Well, it's because this condition of regularity, this condition 3, that RU and RV, the partial derivatives, are not scalar multiples of each other, allows us to use the implicit, uh, the, the inverse function theorem to say that, ah, yes, we do get at least a C1 submanifold of Euclidean space for the image, at least locally, and it enables us to say what the tangent plane to the surface is at that point. So let me go ahead and state a theorem. Uh, the hypotheses seem a little, I don't know, convoluted, but what frequently happens is you start with a function defined on a bigger set. So I'm going to call the function on a bigger set R hat. So with a carat over it, a carat over it. Um, but then you check that this regularity, that the function is C1 on an open neighborhood of some point and that the regularity condition is satisfied at that point, so that RU and RV are not scalar multiples of each other at this point. And then you can say that near that point, so when you restrict to an open neighborhood of that point, you get a local regular parameterization. Nice things happen, and I'm going to call that restriction R. So that's what I'm about to do. Don't let this scare you too much. Theorem. Suppose...
that r hat is a actually let me write r hat equals r hat of uv as a way of saying it's a function of two variables and and giving the variables names. Suppose that r hat is r hat is is a function from a subset E in R2 into R3. Suppose U naught V naught is a point in E such that r hat is C1 on an open neighborhood of u naught v naught and and such that this regularity condition is satisfied, so that r hat u, which exists, this partial derivative exists, because I'm now assuming r hat is c1 in some, some open neighborhood of u naught v naught. So take r hat at u naught v naught, um, and, you know, and r hat, the partial derivative with respect to v, are linearly independent. Now, I just reminded you of what linearly independent meant a minute ago, but it means that these vectors are not scalar multiples of each other, or what's equivalent, the cross product of these two vectors is not zero. Then, we're going to say, there's a big then here, then. So, um, you may have noticed that the conclusion of the theorem in this drawing have magically appeared. Um, so let me, let me uh, explain the picture which will motivate this, the conclusion of the theorem um, before I actually go through it. So what have you got? You have a parameterized surface, parameterized by this R hat. And um, you have these two partial derivative vectors, R, the partial derivative of R hat with respect to U and the partial derivative of R hat with respect to V. Those give you tangent vectors to the surface. Why? Well, as I said before, if you fix one of the variables in the, parameterized surf in the parameterization of the surface, if you fix one of the variables and let the other variable vary, then that defines, that parameterizes a curve on the surface. But our definition of tangent vector was the derivative of a parameterized curve. So, yeah, if you fix V, so that you have a curve parameterized by u, then it's par the partial derivative of r hat with respect to u is the derivative of that parameterized curve, so it gives you a tangent vector. Similarly, the partial derivative with respect to v gives you a tangent vector. In our condition that the two vectors are linearly independent, that neither one's a scalar multiple of the other, uh, constant times the other one, tells us that they're not on top of each other, that they actually define, um, determine a unique plane. And that plane should be the tangent plane to the, to the surface if there is one. Well, it turns out that as a, as a quick application of the inverse function theorem, which I'm not going to prove, um, that in fact you do get a smooth surface that has a tangent plane that's all linear combinations of these two vectors, these two partial derivative vectors. So linear combinations, constant times that vector plus a constant times that vector. Um, at the point um, that's determined, at the point in the surface determined by r at u naught v naught, call that point p. So here's the conclusion. Under our hypotheses, then there exists a connected open neighborhood, w, of u naught v naught in r2, such that the restriction of r hat to w, so call that r, is a one-to-one -one local regular parameterization 
whose image is a C1 surface in R3. So it's a surface that looks smooth. If, in fact, we had assumed R hat was not just C1, but was CK, where K could even be infinity, then the conclusion right here would be the same CK. But typically, what we care about is C1, and certainly for talking about tangent vectors, that's all we need. And furthermore, the collection of tangent vectors to this surface at the image of u naught v naught so at p is given by all the, everything you, of the form a constant times ru plus a constant times rv at that point. Um, so, good. This, um, I, I should be clear, though, that this says there's an open neighborhood of u naught v naught in which all of this is true. It is not an open neighborhood of the point p over here in R3. This the parameterization could actually define something that wraps back around and crosses through itself. And so the whole big range, the whole big image, doesn't have to be a submanifold. So there wouldn't be a tangent plane, or not just one anyway. So um, it's important that this is local. The local here refers to local in R2, an open neighborhood of U0 v in R2, not local in the image in R3. Um, okay, so um, what does this tell us? Look, more stuff has magically appeared on a board. Um, it tells us that this collection of vectors, so the, the tangent vectors, what all the tangent vectors look like there, it's precisely the set of vectors perpendicular to the cross product of RU and RV, which is not zero. That's equivalent to saying they're not scalar multiples of each other, not constant multiples of each other. I'll call that vector n. Um, why? Why are those vectors exactly the vectors that are perpendicular to n? Well, um, this vector is not zero, so the set of vectors perpendicular to it is two-dimensional. Um, this is two-dimensional because RU and RV are not um, multiples of each other, not constant multiples of each other. So this determines a plane. The set of vectors determined by this is a plane. How do you know they're the same plane? Well, because the cross product. You know it's perpendicular to both that vector and to that vector. And that means it's actually perpendicular to every vector of this form, because if you take the dot product of this with n, um, you get a 0 when you dot with that. You get a 0 when you dot with that. And so you get a 0 when you dot with the whole thing. So all of these vectors are perpendicular to n. So the plane determined by this is at least contained in the plane determined this, but they're both planes, so they're the same. Um, so there are two ways to describe all the tangent vectors to our parameterized surface at point u naught v naught, either as, as kind of in this parameterized form where you can let a and b be anything, or you can say it's all the vectors perpendicular to n. But if you want the tangent set, the set of points in the tangent plane, not the collection of tangent vectors, so the t not the tangent space, but the tangent set, it's all the points on this plane. This plane passes through the point P, and then it has these tangent vectors. So as we've discussed before, to get this plane, you have to add P to every possible tangent vector. So what that tells you is the tangent plane itself is parameterized by a point x, y, z is on the tangent plane if and only if you can get it from taking the point p and adding one of these tangent vectors. So this, by changing a and b, this gives you a parameterization of the tangent plane where a and b are the parameters. And from our discussion up here, that's the same as saying the tangent plane, if you want to describe the tangent plane not in its, as a parameterized space, but as where a single equation equals zero, so as a level set, it's, it's where n, this vector that's the cross product, dotted with x, y, z minus your particular point p um, equals 0. All right. Um, I, want, I want to do an example, um, some examples, where we calculate with this um, to, see, to see how it goes. Ah, before I do that. We get tired, <laughs> it gets a little tiresome to say, all right, yeah, the cross product at, at the point 
of are you and RB at the point U naught V naught is not zero. So we know that in a small neighborhood of U naught V naught W, that the image is a C1 surface. And when we talk about the tangent plane, we mean to that surface because if we look at the whole image of the parameterization, maybe the image crosses itself and there's not a tangent plane at the point. It gets annoying to keep talking about taking an arbitrarily small neighborhood. So one piece of terminology we use to, is instead of saying the tangent plane to the image at P, we just say the tangent plane of the parameterization R um, the tangent plane of R at the point U naught V naught. And so we say the tangent plane of the parameterization at the point in the domain. And what that means, if you want to picture it geometrically, is exactly the tangent plane to the image of the parameterization after you've restricted to such a neighborhood W so that the image is, in fact, a submanifold. Um, so yeah, it just saves us having to talk about that restriction all the time to talk about the tangent plane of R at U naught V naught. All right, now let's do a couple of examples. So in one of these, I want to start with a surface we already know and look at two different possible parameterizations of it. And the other one I just want to look at just a parameterization of some surface where it's not some surface. We know ahead of time. So let's look at a cone. So a cone, this two this two-sided cone. We talked about this a long time ago. It's an equation for such a cone would be z squared equals x squared plus y squared. So can we parameterize? this surface? Well, we can try. Um, so let's try something like, how about, I'm going to put an initial question mark <laughs> because you know, our question is, you know, is this good or reasonable? We could try defining R of UV to be, well, we'll just let, we're just going to think, oh, well, maybe X should be U, Y should be v, and then z would be the square root of u squared plus v squared. How's that? Like, is this a nice parameterization of the cone? Well, first of all, it, doesn't, it clearly doesn't even give us the whole cone. This v square root means the non-negative square root. That, that z coordinate would always be greater than or equal to zero. So at best, this is a parameterization of, well, what most people think of as a cone. It's only half of the cone described by that. So, okay, does it give us a, a nice, local, regular parameterization of at least the top half of the cone? No, it doesn't. This is not a local, regular parameterization. Why not? Well, because we know. We've known for a long time. This function, the partial derivatives of this do not exist at zero, at zero, zero. So, um, so in, it means that these don't exist. So neither nor right, the partial derivatives of this you know, if you try to do it, partial derivative with respect to u of, write it as u squared plus v squared to the one half is one half u squared plus v squared to the minus one half times two u. And yeah, the kind of at the heart of the problem is that when u and v are both zero, this would give you division by zero. So if you didn't remember that this isn't differentiable at the origin. That's why you should remember, or that's how you can try to remember. Um, so yeah, no, this is bad. All right, so that's not a good parameterization, or even of the top half. Right, let's try again. Just because, I mean, it is true, maybe I should say that, 
It is true, of course, that all these points that you get this way are on the top half of this cone, and it describes the entire top half of the cone. But we need some differentiability to have nice things. And I should also say, if you ignore the cone point, so if you take out that point, and so you say here that um, our, you know, leave out the point 0, 0 in the domain, so let the domain of this function be all of R2 except the origin, then it's a local regular parameterization of the top half without, but not including, the cone point. All right. What about what looks like a nicer parameterization? So let's try this. How about, so once again, we kind of like to get the entire cone as a parameterized surface. Over there we only really looked at the top half, but Let's try this one. How about we let, uh, we think of V as the radius of, uh, sorry, we think of V as your height, and which would also be the radius of the, the, um, the cross-sectional circle. Well, its absolute value would be the radius. And then let you determine the angle. So what I'm suggesting is let's try v cosine of u, v sine of u, v. Let's try that. So remember, I'm, we're starting with the cone described by this. Do we get this whole cone? Well, if this is x, and this is y, and this is z, well, certainly x squared plus y squared, it's v squared cosine squared plus v squared sine squared. That's v squared. Yeah, equals z squared. So it's certainly true that x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And certainly this time we can get anything for z. And it's pretty clear that at any fixed z coordinate, you get every point on the cross-sectional circle. Yes, this will give us the entire cone. Well, that's nice. So, yeah. It parameterizes the entire cone for us. Is it a local regular parameterization? Well, you might suspect that this bad point right there once again causes a problem. And you'll be right, but let's see that you're right. First of all, this is C1. So this is C1. In fact, it's C infinity. All three of these functions are infinitely, continuously differentiable. That's not a problem um, everywhere. So it's not a problem. Uh, this is a, parameterized, a parameterization of the whole cone. It is a C1 parameterization. However, it is not a local regular parameterization exactly at the origin. Um, ex well, that's the image, the problem, the point that caused the problem over here, but it occurs in the domain. It's not just a single point. So. Let's, um, let's look at that. All right, so fine. It's a C1 parameterization. Why isn't it local, uh, a, a regular, a local regular parameterization? Because if you take the partial derivative of P with respect to U, you get minus V sine of U comma v cosine of u, 0. And the partial derivative of p with respect to v is cosine of u, sine of u, 1. And we'd like to know when these are linearly independent. Now, we could calculate the cross product. I could. But it's... Um, it's easier than that. If this is certainly not the zero vector, it's um, it's got a, a one there. So this is not the zero vector, and um, and this one can't be a scalar multiple of that one because 
or a constant times that one, because any constant times zero would give you zero, so that you could never get this one here. Could this one be a multiple of this one? Yeah, but the scalar would have to be zero. Can, but, and if to get, to multiply that by something and get a zero there, the something would have to be zero. So possibly this is a constant times that vector if the constant is zero, but that would mean all these terms are zero, and that this would have to be the zero vector. Can that happen? Yeah, it can if v is zero. But if v is zero, this is the zero vector, and this is a scalar multiple of that, and that's the only way these can be multiples of each other. So that, yeah, we have a problem. This is not, this too is not a local regular parameterization. And its problem is it's not regular where v is 0. Well, that's the whole u-axis in the uv plane. So if you look at the domain, the domain of this, the uv plane, we have a problem every place that v is 0, so everywhere along here. If we leave out those points, well, then we wouldn't have a connected set, which we want for a local regular parameterization. So if we took where v is positive in the domain, if we took where v is positive, we'd have a connected open set, and the, the emit, or then we'd have a regular parameterization. But if we take where v is positive, we're back where we were with the other one. v is positive describes the top half minus the cone point, where v is 0. So you get that, once again, you get a local regular parameterization of the top half. And when v is negative, you get a local regular parameterization of the bottom half. The cone point causes a problem in either one of these attempts at parameterizations. And it should, because the surface is singular here. It's not a submanifold, and you expect, and yet it's not exactly wrapping around and crossing itself. So you expect there to be a problem with parametrizing this space. All right, but let's look at an example where there's not a problem. It, well, actually, we could do a calculation here at one of the points other than at the origin, but let's look at another example instead. So, all right, in that example, I start with a cone, something we know. And earlier, we start with a cylinder, and we had a hyperboloid. But you can just write down you know, kind of almost random parameterizations. And the surface they parameterize might not be anything you've looked at before. And if you really pick it randomly, it almost certainly isn't. But let's just look at one that I just picked. It's not anything special that I'm aware of. Let's look at RUV equals U squared minus V squared. Uh, U squared minus V, no squared there. V cubed plus U, UV. And I want to find, find parameterizations for the tangent planes of R at, at two different points, at 0, 0, and I think the other one I want to do is 1, 0. No, 1, 1. Um, Well, <laughs> the tangent planes of R at 0, 0, 1, 1. All right. So this is some of the terminology that I told you we would use that um, I've said the tangent planes of R, so tangent planes of a parameterization at points in R2. And exactly what that means is, by, by stating it this way, it better be the case that the cross product of the partial derivatives of R with respect to U and V, um, well, it better be that those partial derivatives are linearly independent. 
so that this parameterization is regular, so that in fact, if I restrict to a small enough neighborhood of 0, 0, the image, in fact, is a submanifold of R3 and has a tangent plane. And that's what I'm parameterizing. And the same thing at 1, 1. It better be the case that the partial derivatives of R with respect to U and V are linearly independent at 1, 1. And then exactly what this tangent plane of R at this point in R2 means is the tangent plane to the image after I restrict to a small enough neighborhood of this point so that the image is, in fact, a submanifold. All right, so let's do this. We need to, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to observe that um, this is certainly a C1 function. In fact, it's C infinity. Those things are infinitely, continuously differentiable. They're polynomials. So that's fine, but we need to check regularity. So we need to calculate the partial of R with respect to u, that is 2u, 1, v. And the partial derivative of r with respect to v is minus 1, 3v squared, u. OK, so we get this. Um, what are they at 0, 0, and well, we'll do 0, 0 first, and then we'll do 1, 1. So let me look at zero zero and then 1, 1. So at 0, 0, what do we get? We get RU at 0, 0 is 0, 1, 0. RV at 0, 0 is minus 1, 0, 0. All right, so we get that. Um, these are certainly linearly independent. Um, you can easily see that this one's not a scalar multiple of, of that one because if you multiply 0 by anything, you can't get a 1. And certainly, if you want to look the other way, this, this one's not a scalar multiple of that one because if you multiply that 0, you can't get that one there. They're not scalar multiples of each other. So the yes, um, they're linearly independent. The, the parameterization R is a local regular parameterization in some open neighborhood of 0, 0, and it's 1 to 1. You can pick a small enough open neighborhood where it's 1 to 1, locally regular, and its image is, uh, in fact, a C infinity submanifold, so a smooth submanifold of R3. And the tangent plane to that submanifold, which we also call the tangent plane of R at 0, 0, is just parameterized by. Ah, I need R of 0, 0. What is R at? I need the point P that I referred to in the parameterization, which is R at 0, 0, which is clearly 0, 0, 0. So a parameterization of the tangent plane, x, y, z equals the point P plus A times R u plus B times R v. In other words, this says, if you just read off the components, well, actually, I'll just combine everything. It says x, y, z equals 0, 0 minus b. Uh, you get 0, a, and then you get 0. It says we get all points x, y, z where x is minus b, y is a, and z is 0. Well, that's everything in the x, y plane where z is 0. So if you take... The, find the normal vector that I called n earlier, the cross product of this and this, well, depending on which order you do it in, you get plus or minus k. So you get plus or minus 0, 0, 1. So, yeah, whether you just, whether you do that calculation, you see this, I, I didn't ask this, this is not the parameterization. This plane is the same as the plane z equals 0. But you can calculate that using the cross product. You can take the cross product of this and this. 
and then say, ah, dot that with x, y, z minus 0, 0, 0 equals 0, and this is what you'll get. Um, all right, that was kind of boring because 0, 0 is so simple. So let's, let's see what happens at 1, 1. It should be a little more interesting. At 1, 1, what happens? Well, we'll need r, the value of r again. So you look at your parameterization. r at 1, 1 is 1 minus 1, 1 plus 1, 1 times 1. Seems kind of silly. Uh, you get 0, 2, 1. The partial derivative of r with respect to u at 1, 1, so I'm using my partial derivative calculation from a minute ago, is 2, 1, 1. The partial derivative of r with respect to v at 1, 1 is minus 1, minus 1, 3, 1. These are not scalar multiples of each other because if you look at the last component, it's the same. So if they were scalar multiples of each other, so if one was a constant multiple of the other, the constant would need to be 1. That would mean the other entries would have to match, which they don't. So once again, the parameterization is local, kind of at, uh, is local, is, is regular at 1, 1. And so it, the theorem tells us in a, in a small enough, or no, and then there exists an open neighborhood of 1, 1, uh, a connected open neighborhood of 1, 1, such that the restriction of that is a local regular parameterization. It's 1 to 1, and its image is a C infinity submanifold. So, and what does the tangent plane to that submanifold look like at 0, 2, 1? Or our other terminology is the tangent plane of R at 1, 1. Parameterization of it, it's easy now. You just write x, y, z equals that point and plus a times this partial derivative plus b times this partial derivative. And that's how you parameterize the tangent plane. Later, when we're interested in area in the next chapter, um, we will use the, uh, the cross product of RU and RV more if you're wondering why I'm emphasizing the parameterization and not the, using the cross product. And it's because we're going to do a lot of that later. And the, the main goal of this section is to deal with parameterization, so it seems more natural to also parameterize the tangent planes. But we'll deal a lot with the cross product of RU and RV, both in chapters 3 and in chapters 4.